。おお。お、the smell of fresh lamb is so so delicious. Their lanolin and woolly smell. Oh, you smell so good. You smell so lovely. I'm Susanna Crampton. I'm living here on uh, our family farm. Our family has been here for eight generations. I grew up as a mid-Atlantean half-bred American Irish and would be here in the summers working in the garden and then educated in the USA. And my agricultural education was in a very interesting agricultural school slash project called the Grassroots Project in Vermont. And one of the main reads in that was a book called Soil and Civilization. So this is the book, Edward Hames, Soil and Civilization. And it's very interesting about how we as the human race have learn to ignore our soils and historically if you look back historically cultural groups and tribal entities and different civilizations have crumbled when they have abused and overused their soils and not paid attention to them when the cherries are in fruit and i have a tour group all of these cherries are from the same stock same kind of edible cherry and i take them through to eat from each of these one, two, three, four, five, six different cherries. And I start them here, and it's really sweet, delicious cherry. And they eat that one. Then I get them to eat this one. And I get them to eat this one, and the next one, all the way to the last one that's up over there. And I say, I want you to taste the flavor of each of those cherries. And some people will say, oh yeah, that's sweet. Oh, that's delicious, delicious, delicious. And I say, at the end, I say, can you taste the difference? And they're like, no. And I said, okay, take one of the cherries from that tree and then come down and eat that one and taste the two. And then they notice the difference. And I say, that is the difference in the soil where the tree is growing. These cherries are all the same kind of cherry, the same breed, the same kind to eat, but the soil is different. So that's where you get the different flavor. And that's why hydroponic tomatoes taste so bland, whereas grown in soil, a tomato will have a much bigger, broader flavor of depth and sweetness or tartness or crispness and it's the soil that makes the difference, and it's the soil that makes food healthy. Dung beetles are one of my hobby horses and have been for years, or you could say it's my soapbox I like to stand on and stomp my foot about. Because dung beetles, I feel, are much more important than pollinators. Now, if we're quiet for a minute, We have a healthy population of swallows, and you can hear them chittering away around here. Part of that is because of our dung beetle population. Dung beetles are vital to soil health. When you want to regenerate soil, you want the dung beetles. We have over 40 different kinds here in Ireland. The dung beetle, the reason it's more important than pollinators is, they are active, ingredients to healthy soil which create healthy plants. Now when you have healthy plants that are within a nutrient cycle that have the extra, plants can't move, they're rooted into a position. So if they're grazed or mowed continuously they need to have a source of food, a, a nutrient dense food and that is what manure is. You could say the cow or the sheep that's going around grazing and ruminating, it's a form of composting. So if you have the cows composting the grazed matter and then they're manuring it out, that's a rich source of nutrients 
for the plant life. The dung beetle comes along, eats the dung, spreads it into a more refined nutrient for the plant life, and then you have the dung beetles that bury it deep under the dung that the plants then eat. So then the plant life is healthier. So the pollen is healthier. So the pollinators are healthier. When you have the healthier pollinators, like the honeybees, they won't necessarily get the varroa mite if they have the healthy pollen, which is inclusive of all the microbial and microbial life with which this manure has contributed to the plant's health. So the healthier a plant is, the healthier the pollen is, the healthier the insect that feeds off of it is. If you have healthy livestock, you have healthy dung beetles. If you have healthy dung beetles, you have a healthy environment. All these aspects are all tied in together and it all comes back to a healthy soil biome. When you have a healthy soil biome and the plant life, trees, herbs, vegetables, whatever coming out of that healthy biome, you and the environment will be healthy. That is what regenerative farming is. That's why dung beetles are so important. That's why we need livestock on the land growing in agroforestry or regenerative practices because they're vital to the baseline of the pyramid of life. So if you look here, it's, there's cow parsley, there's um, docks, buttercups, uh, Herb Roberts, there's ah, cleavers, which chickens, sheep, everybody loves eating this because this is a cleansing plant like dandelions. Uh, if I threw this into the chickens, if I threw some of cleavers and dandelions into the chickens, they would devour them because they're really rich in herbs and minerals that, uh, and a cleansing thing. So, and see, it's cleavered to me. I came back here to our family farm in 1997. And the farm land around had been rented by farmers who were only interested in the monoculture of ryegrass, which is basically a crop, and artificial fertilizer and spraying off weeds and all the rest of it. And so I slowly took over with sheep. And how I farm was contingent on biodiversity and resurrecting the fields around the farm which had been a monoculture of ryegrass. So there was a period of time where I had a huge thistle problem because when the land has been compacted on a monoculture of rye and shallow root systems and then you don't spread nitrogen fertilizer, you know, things like the thistles come through because you're not, you're not potashing the soil and other aspects. So it took years before I could afford to get a multi-species sward seed mix. So there's um, old seed beds at the front of the house. Where I was a child, that was our hay meadow that hasn't been touched by ryegrass or fertilizer in a long, long time. So there was a beautiful, diverse seed bank in spring, uh, there's oceans of snowdrops for the pollinators. I have loads of hellebores. All daffodils were for my, for my grandparents' day. And here you've got um, uh, blue speedwell, daisies. You have a self-sown cherry tree. You have, this is the beginning of my old seed bed. So you have all different kinds and varieties of, of grasses. Let's see, that's one, two, three, just to stroll along the edge. Um, and in here there's purple clover or red clover, depending who you're talking to. There's another different variety of grass. Um, there's bird's foot trefoil. There's yellow clovers. There's yellow clover right there. Uh, vetches. Here's the driveway and you've got uh, sow thistles, you have um, cat's ear, you have mouse ear, you have 
red clover, speedwell, buttercups. Uh, this is oxide daisies, um, plantain. And I would then spread, collect and spread those by hand for years until I got the advance for my book in 2017 that I could then buy a bag of Cotswold seeds, uh, multi-species sward, which I could then spread in the winter paddocks where the sheep were. Uh, and then the next spring, you'd have this diversity growing through. And also the ancient seed bed reactivates itself after a number of years of not being fertilized because there's a lot of seeds in our native species that don't like fertilizer. And then once you activate with the livestock, be it horses or cattle or pigs or sheep, and they're disturbing the soil, they need, you need the impact of the animals to disturb the soil in winter to activate the ancient seed bed. And as the scientists now know, when you want grass to grow, you graze it or you mow it, natural glasses, grasses, because there is in the cow's saliva, activates an enzyme in the grasses to actively make them grow more. So if that is with the grasses and the herbs and the other species, if they've scientifically found that, then there must be also something within the soil and the cloven hooves of the animals. If you smell a cloven hoof that's healthy, there's a richness to it, a kind of earthy scent to it with a hint of um, a microbialness. A healthy foot has a healthy smell. So there's probably an enzyme that when the cloven hooves in winter are going through the soil and making a little muddy patch here or breaking it up over there, that activates those seeds to say, oh, it's okay, we're not gonna be fertilized now, let's grow. So when I came home, this particular field that we call the wind charger, you would not see any cowslips. Now there's cowslips popping up anywhere. I never sowed the cowslips. That's the native seed, ancient bed, reactivating itself and saying, oh, we can breathe now. There's no nitrogen fertilizer nastiness on us. There's no herbicide on us. There's no, you know, so it's, it's all tied together. Down the road, like they found in a grazing animal's enzymes activates, stimulates growth and plant life, they will probably find in the cloven hooves an activation process to ancient seeds. I would not be surprised. It makes sense. Okay, this field in the spring, as you can see the dead daffodils, this is a field full of daffodils in the spring. And this is a lime tree, and under the lime tree, you can see the cow parsley is under there. And the sheep and cattle love eating the cow parsley leaves. But what's seriously cool about cow parsley is that the sap, not for humans, but for livestock, is a fly repellent. The livestock will go and eat the leaves and the flowers off of the cow parsley. And then you have the thick stem coming up and then they do this with their heads. And what they're doing is the sap, they're spreading it all over the face and that keeps the flies away. They know, we don't, we learn. Here's a book that I have that was my grandfather's. This is from 1800. And it has a lot of agricultural practices about cultivating soil. But they don't have the science they back it. They have the knowledge of generations of cultivating soil. And what's happened historically in the last 100 years is we've lost the knowledge of how to cultivate soil without artificial uh, infusions of petroleum-based herbicides, insecticides, all the sides, as well as uh, fertilizers and things like that. We've, we're only um, producing food from novel entities, not from the natural aspect. And 
this survey, it's really interesting to read stuff that are in here that has now become scientifically acknowledged as how it works within a growing scheme for grassland or vegetables or uh, fruits or all those kind of things. This field has not seen fertilizer for over 10 years, I can't remember. And I think you'd uh, say there isn't a lack of growth. There's plenty of growth. Okay. If you look down here, you can see there's yarrow, there's a kind of buttercup, there's one clover, there's a different kind of clover, there's a daisy, there's, let's see, is there any bird's foot trefoil? Uh, buttercups, yes, thistles, docks. There's all kinds of different species in here. And this was one of the places where I baled gray. There's a cowslip over there. Um, there's a speedwell. Then the, for the grasses, there is a brome. There's another species, another species. Let's see, that's another species. So there's another species. So that's, you know, a whole plethora of different species of grasses. And that's what biodiversity is. It isn't just grass. It isn't just legumes. It isn't just herbs. It's the multiplicity of each one of those. So the clovers will be a varieties of uh, red and different whites and, oh, is that a four leaf clover? No, dang, that would have been perfect. Um, and different trefoils and vetches and things like that. And about allowing them to seed on. This is a cowslip that, you know, I'll hopefully allow to be seed on. So, for example, you take something like dandelions. Dandelions are one of the most nutritious spring foods for humans and livestock. And dandelions come up at the precise moment when naturally herbivores would be lactating. So they're very high in the nutritional content that lactating animals need to make their milk very healthy for their young as well as retaining their own biological health. And the other aspect of dandelions, when you go around now and you see a field full of dandelions and you think, wow, excellent for pollinators, excellent for the dairy farmer, or I would be saying that the dairy farmer would want to go out and spray the dandelions off. Dandelions, when they're spread all over the place, is also a sign that the soil is not well. There, it's a sign of compaction, of mineral deficiency, of microbial life deficiency, of lack of aeration, all these different aspects. If there is a weed that you have that's prolific on your soil or in your garden or in your fields, one should take it as telling you something. What is the soil lacking? What en enzyme, what mineral, what vitamins is it lacking oxygen? Is it lacking filtration? Is it compacted? Thistle usually is another compaction plant, but it's also to do with lack of um, potash. So if you have wood ash and you have an area where a lot of thistles are growing, spread a lot of your wood ash and the next year you won't have thistles. Okay, you strim them down now or you weed them out, but you spread the wood ash and your thistle problem is gone. So it's basically finding the balance of what is wrong with the soil rather than what a lot of modern agricultural science is. Modern agricultural science is not preventative medicine. It is trying to fix problems created by problems created by problems. So you have all these stepping stones of problems 
and you've left the cultivation and understanding of soil behind, our ancestors might not have understood the science of how the soil worked to cultivate food for us, but they knew how to superficially do it or through the wives' tales. Like, we'll go back to dandelions. You know, dandelions were once known as dairyman's gold. Why was it known as dairyman's gold? They didn't know why, but they understood that the animals loved eating it and their milk was better and tastier and the animals were healthier. Now with science, we understand that it's high in all the vitamins and minerals that a lactating animal needs to produce healthy milk for a healthy offspring. It's really, to me, it's absolutely fascinating how modern science is caught catching up with a load of wives' tales because people didn't know why something worked, but now science is saying, hey, we got the answer, this is how it works.